Hello everyone and welcome to part two of what I hope will be a long series on Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It, whether you're listening to this right now live or whether you're listening to it at some point in the future, I hope things are going well for you and that uh, your search for quality in the spirit of piercing is going well. If you're new to our channel, you may want to check out some of our other videos. Many of them are uh, on philosophic topics like this one and many of them are also uh, more project oriented. So we hope you'll check those out and enjoy those as well. So last time I talked about why I think Pierre Sig's book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, is so important, um, why it's a book that's worth reading and worth thinking about and worth doing a long lecture and discussion series on even 50 years after it's published. Um, and in that sense, I guess I'm, uh, I tackled the question of why I would consider it to be um, something of a modern day classic. Another thing that I tackled um, was the one of the, some of the beginning events that happened in the book and about the importance of mental models and uh, about the importance of how those mental models shape your perception and shape what it is that you see. And we saw that with uh, Piercig and his son Chris on the motorcycle. We're going to be digging into that second set of ideas about mental models quite a bit more today. Um, what I'm hoping to talk about today is first about the Chautauquas, uh, what a Chautauqua is and why Piercig is using this as a format for, uh, for delivering his ideas, why he's using this as one of the formats that he wants to write his book in. And then the second thing that I'm hoping to discuss is some of the ideas that he proposes in chapter two about attitude. And uh, I think that those ideas about attitude, especially to very scientifically minded readers, uh, might come across as a little counterintuitive, but I think that if you dig into the ideas and examine them carefully uh, and understand them a little bit better, you'll see exactly how it plays out, and you'll um, come to you'll you'll end up on Piercing's side that um, attitude, even even in sort of a very hard bitten scientific empirical way, um, attitude actually is quite important. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and let's see. Let me check my notes here. So let's talk about this Chautauqua. What is a Chautauqua? Um, if you're like me, Chautauqua is a word that you never before heard until you read Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And if anyone in the chat ha did hear that word at some point before reading Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, uh, tell me about it because I, I don't know where you could run across this idea. If you Google it, what you find out is that it is, let's see, quote, uh, a movement, it's a popular U.S. movement in adult education that flourished during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And to me, that's not very illuminating at all, because if it's that important and if it was uh, that influential, then why haven't I ever heard about it before um, until reading Piercing's book? Um, but the way that he describes a Chautauqua is, I think, helpful. Let's go ahead and pull that out. So he says the following, what I have in mind is a sort of Chautauqua. That's the only name I can think of for it. Like the traveling tent show Chautauquas that used to move across America, this America, the one that we are now in, an old time series of popular talks intended to edify and entertain, improve the mind and bring culture and enlightenment to the ears and thoughts of the hearer. The Chautauquas were pushed aside by faster paced radio, movies, and TV, and it seems to me the change was not entirely an improvement. Perhaps because of these changes, the stream of national consciousness moves faster now, and is broader, but it seems to run less deep. The old channels cannot contain it, and in its search for new ones, there seems to be growing havoc and destruction along its banks. In this Chautauqua, I would not like to cut any new channels of consciousness, but simply dig deeper into old ones that have become silted in with the debris of thoughts grown stale and platitudes too often repeated. What's new is an interesting and broadening eternal question but one which, if pursued exclusively, results only in an endless parade of trivia and fashion, the silt of tomorrow. I would like instead to be concerned with the question, what is best? And again, you see there the, the subtitle, right? An inquiry into values, an inquiry into what is best. I would like instead to be concerned with the question, what is best? A question which cuts deeply rather than broadly, a question whose answers tend to move the silt downstream. So uh, the way he describes a Chautauqua there, Right, it's a it's an old time series of popular talks intended to edify, to entertain, to improve the mind, and bring culture and enlightenment to the ears and thoughts of the hearer. Um, so you could you could think of it kind of as um, modern edutainment, but a little bit more probably on the entertainment side. 
or excuse me, a little bit more on the education side rather than the entertainment side. And I find that very interesting that you have here something that is intended both to educate and to entertain. You know, when you think about many of our institutions of education, um, when you think about schools, when you think about college lectures, when you think about textbooks, um, the idea that they're supposed to entertain is just it's it's not an idea that that anyone believes, right? Nobody thinks of college lectures as entertaining. Um, if so, then those lectures are certainly the exception, not the rule. Um, they're far from the rule. They're anything but the rule. And so I find, uh, you know, Piercing's idea here again. Remember how he's how he talks about, um, you know, in, in some sense, you could see this book as an attempt to uh, to to combine aesthetics and science, or to combine to combine um, objective and subjective viewpoints, or as he'll describe in a couple of chapters, classical and romantic viewpoints. And so, so notice he's already doing a combination here. He's saying, so that thing you call education, that thing you call entertainment. Well, what if we kind of what if what if these were two different gears, and we tried to mesh those gears and see how they could turn together, how they could interact? And I find that to be an, an incredibly interesting idea, especially because. Um, you know, I see some movements towards something like a Chautauqua today. I mean, so for instance, and somebody um, has mentioned this already, I, they mentioned it during the last discussion, that uh, this, what I'm doing right now is kind of a Chautauqua, right? And, and it's probably uh, not that entertaining, and I apologize for that. Um, but uh, but it is it is an attempt to bring education to um, to a lot of different people. It is sort of a, a broad cut at education instead of sort of the isolated uh, university approach that serves uh, 30 students in a classroom or 300 students in a classroom at um, at a time. I also see other examples of sort of a modern Chautauqua movement. I think podcasts are like this, and I think that there are tons of YouTube channels um, that are very much like this, right? And, and again, our YouTube channel is like this, right? We're not just trying to um, entertain, and we're not just trying to educate. In some sense, we're trying to do both. We're trying to uh, present something that is engaging um, and that is engaging across multiple levels, right? It's not just engaging in an abstract sort of philosophic way, and it's not just engaging in the sort of like, ooh, eye candy visual effects way, but it's it's engaging across multiple levels of experience at the same time. And maybe you could say those multiple levels include entertainment and education, and that is fundamentally what a Chautauqua is. And so I think it's I think it's amazing. I think it's wonderful that Piercing is trying to do that. And I wish, like I said, I think that there are many sources today that are impl are employing something like a Chautauqua mode of discourse. Um, and I, I just, I, I deeply hope that our society doubles down on that. I hope we double down on that and produce more Chautauqua-like material. Um, Alo Walla, welcome to you uh, from Germany and anyone else in the chat, wherever you are in the world. Um, again, hope you're all well. Um, so that's the mode that Piercing is trying to speak in. Is he's trying to deliver for us a Chautauqua. And remember, though, a Chautauqua, so far this has just been a novel, right? We've just learned about uh, him riding a motorcycle across the country with his son and his friends. Now we're going to move into kind of the more philosophic mode of um, discourse that this book has, right? And that's the Chautauqua portion. Okay, so what is the ch this Chautauqua going to be at, about? Excuse me. Um, and what he says is fundamentally it's going to be about uh, technology, and it's going to be about two different approaches to technology. And it's going to be about uh, these two different approaches to technology. One of these approaches is one that he embodies, and one approach is uh, one that his friends John and Sylvia embody. And we're going to learn quite a bit more about those approaches as we go through the book, um, that they're going to be named classical and romantic, and we're going to learn quite a bit about them and quite a bit about what lays beyond them. But um, this is a good starting point for Piercing. Um, is, is, is this uh, Chautauqua about technology, this discussion of, ch of technology um, and John and his own approach to it? So the difference in their approach is that John basically hates technology. He can't stand it. He doesn't want to do... This is, embl this is uh, most emblematic in the way that he doesn't want to do any maintenance on his own motorcycle. Whereas uh, Piercig, the author, does enjoy maintaining his own motorcycle and finds um, aesthetic and intellectual satisfaction in that. Um, so he finds it to be a very valuable activity, but John does not find it to be a particularly valuable activity. Um, and John sometimes has a name for this, right? Because it's, it's not just the motorcycle. It's also, there's a story about a dripping faucet. It's, it's all the technology and it's something in the technology, right? Um, that John occasionally calls it or it all, or the whole organized bit, or the whole thing, or the system. So the way Piercy describes this is, is that John sees it in motorcycle maintenance, but it resides in lots of other uh, technological phenomena, processes, and experiences. And by contrast, Piercig wants, he doesn't want to hold that world at arm's length. Instead, he wants to jump right in. Um, he does the, the maintenance on his own mo motorcycle. He likes understanding um, how these things work. Another way that um, John, or excuse me, that Piercy describes 
uh, what John is running from is he says is it's something uh, in an, an excuse me an inhuman mechanical lifeless blind monster or death force and far later in the book in chapter 24 he'll call it technological hopelessness um, and the way he presents this is very much in terms of technology and there's also um, significant flavors remember this book was written about 50 years ago if I remember rightly in 74 so it's uh, after slash during sort of the hippie counterculture movement and so a lot of this is phrased in terms of technology a lot of this is phrased in terms of um, environmentalism a lot of this is uh, phrased in that kind of language and one thing that I want to bring up is uh, you know what were one question I guess is, is a better way to frame it one question that I had as I was preparing my notes on this was okay do we have that same sort of hang up about technology that Piercig and uh, that, that Piercig and John have. Do we have that same sort of discussion going on um, about technology? And I wondered about that. I'm not sure that we do. I'm not sure that we do. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, during the hippie counterculture movement, and obviously I wasn't alive for that, so if there's anyone in the chat who uh, was alive for that, I'd certainly be interested to hear your perspective. Um, but my understanding of the hippie counterculture movement is, is that a large part of it is, is this sense of distrust for technology. Where do you see technology? You see technology uh, in these large factories that are spewing pollution. You see technology uh, in the advent of the atom bomb that threatens civilization. And so when you think technology, you don't have uh, very many... You don't have very many positive associations with the idea of technology. Almost all the associations are negative. And that's why the hippie counterculture movement is associated with flowers and with, with Woodstock, this festival in the woods, right? You, you don't associate it with technology. Uh, technology, in some sense, is, is one of the enemies of the hippie counterculture movement. And I thought, okay, so fair enough, but do we still think about technology that same way today? And, you know, I'm not sure we do. And I think part of the reason is because... Um, I think part of the reason is because many of the ecological and environmental problems that uh, technology seems to have caused things like uh, pollution are now being solved by technology you know so uh, if, if you don't like coal-fired power plants you know the answers that we propose to that now aren't um you know we don't propose oh well you know just rip the whole system down and go back and live in the woods instead what we tend to say is well well maybe we could use nuclear power um or maybe we could use geothermal power or wind power or solar power right and all these are very very high-tech uh processes and applications right these this is not uh you know go back and live in the woods kind of stuff this is instead let's be ecologically and environmentally friendly um, but let's do it in a high-tech way, right? So I don't know if we really see technology as the enemy in the same way that Piercig's audience, right, these these readers in the 70s uh, and, you know, their precursors in the 60s during the hippie counterculture movement, I'm not sure if they have the same attitudes about technology that we do today, even if they have the same uh, values um, in terms of environmentalism and, and, uh, and ecology and things like that. So then I thought, okay, well, that's interesting, though, because I, to, to me, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance still seems deeply important. What Piercing is saying still seems deeply important, and I'm certainly not the only one. So how, how, how do Piercing's ideas apply out of the specific context of the hippie counterculture movement and up into... Uh, you know, the 21st century, up into the year 2020 and beyond. And I, I have a proposal about this, right? Um, so, so here's, and, and as far as I know, this is actually a, sort of a semi-original contribution to scholarship and discussion on Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. So I'm, I'm kind of proud of myself for finding this problem. And then, you know, here's my solution that I'm going to propose, right? Um, so let's think about some other things where we tend to find this death force, right? So John describes technology as it, it all, the whole organized bit, the whole thing, the system, right? Um, so what are the what are the things that we describe in that way in the modern world? And I thought about a few things. Uh, so we don't like corporations, right? Uh, and this is particularly true for the cultural and political left. But broadly speaking, uh, in the modern world, we do have um, a lot of distrust for corporations. We have a lot of distrust for large corporations. We think that they're faceless bureaucracies that don't have their employees' interests at heart. They don't have the public's interest in, in, at heart. They don't have your interests at heart. They don't have my interests at heart. Um, they instead serve this mysterious purpose that nobody can see, right? But that is, uh, but that uh, the system judges to be just incredibly important, right? And that's why we have giant corporations. Um, so I thought of corporations. Here's another one: um, is government, right? So we don't we don't particularly trust or like government, and this is particularly true for the political and cultural right. Uh, but it is broadly true across certainly American culture, and I think culture more broadly across the Western world. Um, that we we look at governments. And we think, you know, 
uh, yes, we'd like you to solve our problems, but we also kind of think you're a giant faceless bureaucracy that's not accountable. Um, you know, you're all corrupt. And this is really interesting because um, there's, there's surveys of Americans that show that they like their own Congress people, uh, but they don't approve of Congress as a whole, right? So there is this sense that, oh, you know, the political system doesn't work. It's all corrupt. None of it works. Um, you know, th that's a sense that we have, and I'm not going to necessarily adjudicate the truth of that. I just want to point out that that is the cultural sense we have, right? Okay, so we don't like, uh, we don't like corporations. We don't like uh, governments. Let's go down the list and find some more. Um, industry in general, we uh, have some skepticism about industry um, in a variety of ways, right? I mean, you don't know where, you know, documentaries will circle about... Uh, the treatment of animals in, uh, you know, large farming operations, large animal farming operations, and uh, the conditions that they're in, and you know, large segments of the population will say, "Oh my word, that's terrible!" Right? This is this is awful. Um, and you can do the same thing for there's the same kind of sense of disquiet, discomfort, or distrust around other kinds of industry, right? Like a uh, like car manufacturer or um, or steel processing, right? Um, you know, part of the, the 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 influence of globalism, the moving of uh, industrial capacities overseas, you know, it creates this sort of black box where you're like, well, I don't know where any of the products that I'm using are coming from, and I don't know if I can trust any of this, right? And and again, my point is not that that's warranted or not warranted. I think it's, you know, certainly warranted to some degree, and the precise degree would be an issue of discussion, right? Um, my, my point is to to raise the fact that that's happening, that we have that sort of sense about industry, that sort of um, distrust of uh, the uh, of the industrial systems that surround us, right? Um, jobs, you know, lots of us uh, have this sort of skepticism about our jobs too, right? And this is sort of linked to our skepticism and distrust of um, of employers and corporations, right? We don't have the sense that the business we're working for has our best interest at heart, right? We don't have the sense um, we have the sense again that it's a faceless bureaucracy and that our job is meaningless and that it's uh, and, and, you know, many, many people, you know, millennials or generation Xers, excuse me, generation Zers, um, will, will have this complaint about their jobs and they'll say, you know, well, I want to find a job that has some meaning. And, uh, you know, what I want to point out is that that attitude seems to reflect a distrust of the, of, of our, of our business practices, right? It seems to indicate a distrust of the way that we do business in the modern world, right? And so again, I'm, I'm, I'm using all these as examples to say that thing that John sees in technology and Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance, uh, I think we're seeing it now. We're seeing it a little bit less in technology, but we are seeing it in other things. Um, like for instance, so far corporations, um, businesses, um, industry, and our, our jobs. Um, school, right? Um, we are so cynical about school. We are so cynical about school. And if you don't believe that, like go find a high schooler and talk to them about the idiot faceless bureaucracy that they feel like they have to face every day at school, right? And, um, you know, part of that perhaps is just inherent to being a teenager, right? But part of it, I think, is definitely valid, Right? I think part of it definitely is valid. Um, the, the sense that you know schools are these are these terrible, um, faceless bureaucracies that have no connection to the real world, and it's just you know it's it's a it's just designed to coop kids up and uh, babysit them for eight hours a day until we can spit them out after high school, hopefully with a diploma, hopefully to go off to college, right? We, I mean, we definitely have a sense about that. And although I think our skepticism about higher education is a little bit less than our skepticism um, about uh, primary and secondary education, um, I think we do have that skepticism about higher education too, right? Um, you know, if you belong to um, certain, well, I mean, you know, that, you know, perhaps, perhaps the idea that college is a scam, the idea that, uh, you know, uh, college debt has robbed young Americans of their chance to have a good life. Um, all sorts of things like that. If you belong to the political or cultural right, um, then you 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 know you believe that universities are these uh, you know terrible nests of of uh, uh, indoctrinated communist sympathizers and so forth. Right. That's also an attitude that exists. Right. And and again, my point is not necessarily to comment on any of these attitudes specifically, but just to say, hey, look, that attitude exists. We are seeing the same problem that John and Piercing are seeing. Right. And that's part of what makes Zen the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance such an important and relevant book, even today, you know, even long after the hippie counterculture movement. Right. OK, what else? Um, you know, we can also have this sense sort of about the whole world that it's out to get you, that our, our systems of government and our culture are just inherently corrupt and there's no way to get ahead and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, you, you can kind of see from there the litany of um, the litany of accusations that can easily flow out towards all of our institutions. 
right? Um, and so all of these we could sum up together as the system, let's say, right? Uh, you know, or I've I've never actually watched the there's there's a movie about uh, Jack Black stars in it, and he he substitutes it, a School of Rock, I think it's called. I've never actually watched the movie, um, but but there's there's this idea uh, that I've that I've, uh, I, I I saw some other people reenact a scene from the movie um, about the man, right? The man. It's the it's also it's the same thing as the system, right? The system is out to get you, whether that's the political system or the corporate system or the industrial system or what have you, and it's just uh, you know uh, irredeemably corrupt and bad, and uh, there's no point in cooperating with it. Um, and the further we can run away from it, the better, right? It's the system, it's the man, it's the way things are, and that that resides in our education, or it's perceived to reside, I guess I should say, to be a little more precise. It's perceived to reside in our systems of education, in our systems of industry, in our systems of labor, in our systems of, uh, of business and uh, economics and exchange and our politics, and it's just everywhere, right? So if you sympathize with any of those views that I've just said, then Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, I think, is all about solving that problem. It's not just about solving the problem of, a, of sort of a death force that resides in technology. It's about the problem of a death force that resides in systems of all kinds. Uh, not just technology. And I think, uh, you know, although it's not a thing that Piercing explicitly says, I think this is very, very well borne out um, by the way that he talks about technology and the way that he analyzes it and the way that he says, hey, look, technology is mostly not physical material. Technology is mostly systems of ideas, right? Um, it's mostly it's mostly a set of ideas. One of the ways he describes a motorcycle later in the book is that it's, it's primarily not steel because steel can be any shape. A motorcycle is not steel. It's a system of ideas worked out in steel. It's a system of relationships worked out in steel. Um, so, and by the way, this also makes it so that Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and it's uh, the, the thesis that it's going to advance about systems um, is, you know, it's a very, it's a potentially a very large tent, you know? If, um, if you're kind of, you know, uh, far left wing, uh, you know, eat the rich type of person, um, Piercing is trying to address that problem. And if you're the kind of person who's, uh, you know, politically and culturally very far on the right and, and does believe that uh, universities are uh, primarily centers of Marxist indoctrination, well, guess what? Piercing's addressing that problem, too. That's one of the things that I think is so striking about uh, this book is, is that it really is applicable. It really is trying to tackle these problems, um, you know, that, that people are perceiving um, across across a huge swath of culture, across a, across a huge swath of politics, you know, like almost almost no matter who you are in the modern world, I think you can find your problems in Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, and hopefully, therefore, you can find some solutions. Um, it looks like uh, JB's in the chat, so welcome. Uh, and you know, it's it's good to see your uh, you, you uh, resist your allergy to Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. So. Um, Okay, so that's that's the subject of the Chautauqua, and that's the way that the, Chau the Chautauqua that he's talking about, I think, anyway, um, applies to our modern world. Uh, it's not just technology. Maybe it's not even primarily technology. It's the systems, right? It's, it's the man, right? Um, so there you go. And, and notice that if you, if you have this sort of attitude about the systems around you, right? If you have this sort of attitude about the systems around you, then this puts you into a trilemma, right? So if you've heard a dilemma, right? A dilemma is a situation in which you have two options and neither of them is particularly appealing, but um, by circumstances, you're compelled to choose one of those two options, right? And a trilemma is fundamentally the same thing, except for there's three options instead of two, right? So here's, here's sort of uh, your, your three options. Right. Um, so one is you can sort of uh, participate in the system, right? In which case it will just absolutely chew you into hamburger, right? Uh, because, you know, the, the school system or, or corporations or government or whatever, you know, it doesn't have your best interest at heart. It's just going to chew you up and spit you out, right? So you could get turned into hamburger by the system. That's, that's one of the three horns of the trilemma. Um, the second horn of the trilemma, another option, is you could try to rebel against the system, right? So you could try to, uh, you know... Uh, eat the rich if you're on the political left, or restore federalism if you're on the right, um, or you know if uh, you could try to reform our schools, you could try to reform our system of economics, so on and so forth, right? You can you can try to rebel against the system um, and reform it, right? Uh, or or I think better said, you can try to destroy it. As as I think more a more accurate view on this uh, sort of portion of the trilemma, right? Um, you know, rip it down and build something better in its place. Um. And then the third option is to flee from the 
flee from these systems, right? So uh, you could do, you know, what my compatriot JB has done and go uh, live in the in a, in a back corner of, of your state, in a more rural section of your state, right? Um, you know, I know, I know JB's listening, so I, I, I don't mean that in any kind of insulting way, obviously. And uh, while I make that aside, also welcome um, to, to all of you who are listening in the chat and, you know, greetings also to you from the Czech Republic, uh, you know, greetings from the United States. Um, okay, so there's your trilemma, right? You either need to submit to the system and get chewed into hamburger by it, or else you need to fight against it and destroy it, or else you need to run away from it and escape it, right? And uh, JB and I have talked about this, other Joseph and I have talked about this quite a bit. Um, and we have this this really interesting sort of analogy to describe this trilemma, right? And it's it's the, the parable of the Kevlar cow, if you will. All right, so here's the parable of the Kevlar cow, right? Um, you have a bunch of cows grazing in the in, in the field, right? And what's going to happen to these cows is they're going to be taken to a slaughterhouse and turned into hamburger, right? And then they're going to be made, made into McDonald's beef patties, right? So that, that uh, slaughterhouse, let's say, is the system, right? It's, you know, whichever incarnation of the system you prefer, whether that's government or your job or corporations or the economy or technology, in the case of John, or it's the school system, what have you, right? Uh, that's what the slaughterhouse more or less represents, is this, this giant faceless bureaucratic system. So one thing that you could do as a cow in the, in the um, you know, here in, you know, grazing in the field is you could just uh, go into the slaughterhouse and get turned into hamburger, right? So you docilely submit to everything you say, no, like the, the, the system is good. The slaughterhouse is good, right? And then you, you well, you get t turned into hamburger, obviously. So maybe that's a, you know, not the most ideal solution. I think probably most people would agree. I certainly don't think it's a very ideal solution. Okay, well, let's, let's go on the second horn of the trilemma and see what you could do. Okay, so the second horn of the trilemma is you could rebel. So, so um, these are the cows who will, um, <laughs> to to borrow uh, to borrow the lyrics of an of an old song on a YouTube video about uh, Kevlar or not Kevlar cows. Um, oh shoot, it's a it's a video about cows. It's sort of this animated cartoon music video, cows with guns. That's what it is. If you want to go search that in YouTube, you'll have a good time looking at the cows with guns video. Anyway, so you'll listen uh, to the teachings of Khao Satung, the famous revolutionary. Uh, you'll arm yourself with AK-47s and you'll storm the slaughterhouse uh, and and take it over, right? And um, lots of people do choose this option, and maybe you think that's the best option. Uh, but Piercing is ultimately going to say, "Hey, that's not that's not the best option, right?" But I, I I can understand certainly why it's appealing. I think the main problem with it is that at the end of the day, you have a bunch of AK-47s. Um, you have a bunch of AK-47s, torches, and pitch, pitchforks. You killed a bunch of people, and also you now own a slaughterhouse. And it's like, okay, you know, this doesn't seem like the ideal mode of life either. It really doesn't. Um, you know, perhaps better than getting turned into hamburger, but certainly not ideal. Certainly, there ought to be something that's better. Okay, and then of course your third option in the in this uh, cow trilemma is that you can you flee the slaughterhouse, right? Uh, so you relocate. You know, you jump the fence, um, and the, hopefully that doesn't result in an utter disaster. And uh, you flee into the woods, and uh, you know you you live a peaceful cow existence out in the woods, far away from the slaughterhouse. And uh, incidentally, this is the approach that Piercing thinks that John and Sylvia are taking is what they're essentially doing is they're running away from technology. And that this is actually why they go on these motorcycle trips is because riding a motorcycle is this incredible, wonderful, aesthetic experience that's so distant from the technology, right? And Piercing does point out there's a little bit of hypocrisy here, like you're riding on a motorcycle, you're riding on this technological artifact. But John and Sylvia are able to not think of it as a technological artifact. They're able to think of it just as this purely aesthetic experience, right? And so they're actually running away from all the systems by riding on these motorcycles, right? And so John and Sylvia are in the run away from the uh, cow slaughterhouse strategy, right? And what Piercing is going to say is that he thinks that's actually not really the best option. At the end of chapter one, he says, uh, I disagree with them about cycle maintenance, right? So he disagrees about their, their approach. Uh, by the way, the parable of the cows is not yet finished. At some point, we'll talk about Kevlar cows and uh, how what Piercing would say about Kevlar cows, about that very strange idea of a cow wearing Kevlar armor. Um, but So here's what Piercing has to say at the end of chapter one about systems and about cycle maintenance and about John and Sylvia's approach to technology. He says, I disagree with them about cycle maintenance, but not because I am out of sympathy with their feelings about technology. So he's saying, hey, look, I see the same problem in technology. I see this death force. I see, I, I see all the bad things about the system that you're seeing or all the potentially bad things. But he says, I just think that their flight from and hatred of technology is self-defeating. The Buddha, the Godhead, 
resides quite as comfortably in the circuits of a digital computer or the gears of a cycle transmission as he does at the top of a mountain or in the petals of a flower. To think otherwise is to demean the Buddha, which is to demean oneself. That is what I want to talk about in this Chautauqua. So what Piersig is going to say is, I, I understand what you're saying, John and Sylvie, and I understand that you're seeing this death force in technology. I understand all that. But I think that the flight from it is definitely not the right option. And in fact, in just a chapter or two, what he's going to tell us is he wants to aim straight at that death force. He wants to go into the maw of the beast, right? And he's going to see, not if you can run from the slaughterhouse, not if you can run from the system, and not if you can sort of uh, take it over by violent revolution, and not that you just submit to it either and get chewed up by it. That's not what he's going to say either. Instead, he's going to see if there's a way to redeem, in a sense, motorcycle maintenance, if there's a way to repair it or to heal it uh, and to, to, to make it whole, right? Not to destroy it, not to just let it have its way and not to escape it, uh, but to actually live in, in kind of a partnership and harmony with it, right? And that, that's such a unique solution. I just want to point that out as long as we're here. That's such a unique solution to problems. Uh, because if you look at all the problems in your life, uh, you, I think there's a really good chance that you kind of prefer one of the three horns of the trilemma, right? Either you just say, look, it's just a problem and we just have to live with it, right? Or else you say, well, no, like, uh, we're going to escape this problem permanently, right? Like, if, if only those darned Republicans or Democrats weren't in my country, then everything would be fine, right? Or alternately, to uh, <laughs> to use the political analogy, to, to move to Canada, right? To, to try to escape the system entirely, to try to escape that death force entirely. And what Piercing is offering is another way out. Um, that's what he's going to try to propose in this book. He's, go he's going to try to propose another approach to the problems of life, um, and particularly to those problems that seem to be systemic, and particularly to those problems that seem kind of difficult to lay your finger on, these uh, these death forces that might inhabit different parts of our lives. Um, yeah, that's a, this is actually a great point to address something in chat. Uh, Struggler says, is this, is this book equal parts Buddhist philosophy and motorcycle maintenance? I actually really love what he says at the very beginning in the front matter of the book, which is uh, that the book is not very factual on motorcycles or Zen Buddhism. Uh, the title of the book is, is actually a parody of another book, uh, Zen and the Art of Archery. Uh, so I think the title of the book is somewhat intended as uh, rather tongue-in-cheek. And um, the, the whole book very much reminds me of a koan. It's, or, or almost, no, it, 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 I would almost say as a joke, not in the sense that it's uh, you know frivolous or to be taken lightly, um, but in the sense that you know it, with a joke, there's meanings inherent in the joke that go beyond the literal meaning of the words on the page. Right. I mean, that's why jokes are funny. Right. That's that's why puns exist is because of ambiguity of meanings, because of multiple meanings. Right. And this book is very much a Cohen. It's very much a Zen Cohen. If you don't know what a Cohen is, I'll be explaining that in a little bit, I think, as we get further in the book. Um, and we start talking about the authorship problem in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. But but for those of you who do know what a Zen Cohen is, I definitely think that it's like a Zen Cohen. And what that means is that you should not take anything in this book at face value. It's something to be chewed on. It's something to be pondered. It's something to be uh, meditated on. To uh, to continue to borrow bovine metaphors, uh, we should chew the cud with this book, right? Uh, you know, cows chew the cud. They chew their food uh, quite extensively, and that's what we should do as in the art of motorcycle maintenance, I think. Or, you know, really, uh, probably most good books. Okay, so... I've said that, you know, Piercing is going to propose this sort of uh, solution to the trilemma of systems, right? The solu this uh, other solution to the, um, to the trilemma of the technological death force that John and Sylvia are running away from. So let's talk a little bit about what that is. He's going to give us a few hints in Chapter 2, and we are finally getting to Chapter 2, so that's wonderful. Uh, I wanted to get a, look, a lot further in the first... Uh, video than I did, and so it's it's making me question just how much material I'll be able to cover and just how long this will take. Um, but, but well, we're, we're making pretty good progress, right? We're starting chapter two, and that's, I think we'll even get all the way through chapter two, and that's what I was hoping to do this time around. So here's another interesting quote, right? Um, what we actually find out, and let me uh, set up the quote a little bit. What we actually find out uh, during chapter two is that John and Sylvia and Chris and Piercing are on their motorcycles and they're riding through the Dakotas and they're hoping to get to Billings, Montana. And something that they actually considered doing was that John and Chris and Piercing would ride on the motorcycles and that Sylvia would fly into Billings, Montana and meet them there. Um, so she wouldn't have even come on the motorcycle trip at all. And here's a quote about that. 
Um, John was worried Sylvia would not be up to the discomfort of this and planned to have her fly to Billings, Montana. But Sylvia and I both talked him out of it. I argued that physical discomfort is important only when the mood is wrong. Then you fasten on to whatever thing is uncomfortable and call that the cause. But if the mood is right, then physical discomfort doesn't mean much. Right, so I just want to kind of sit in this idea for a little bit because it's a, it's a wonderfully interesting idea. Um, so what he says is, the, the, the problem here is that maybe Sylvia is going to get uncomfortable on this long motorcycle trip. And if you've ever ridden on a motorcycle for, you know, many, many hours, you know that you, you can get just a little bit sore and stiff, right? It's not... It's not the, the most comfortable mode of transportation, right? And so to take a multi-day uh, multi trip across the Dakotas in the summer sun on a motorcycle is going to be a lot less comfortable than, you know, taking a, I don't know what it would be, perhaps a two-hour flight um, out to Billings, Montana, from where they're starting in, I think, Minnesota. Um, and Piercig is going to say something, Piercig is saying something really interesting about this, right? He says, hey, look, hey, look, hey, look. She actually isn't going to mind the physical discomfort. What matters is the mood. So it's not the physical discomfort, it's the mood. And when you have, uh, when, when the mood is right, a little bit of physical discomfort doesn't matter. And when the mood is wrong, uh, you know, you look at the physical discomfort and you see that as the cause of your bad mood. So uh, fundamentally what he's, what he's saying here, right, is it's sort of like uh, the question of like having a positive attitude, right? Um, he's saying, look, if you, if you, if you have a good attitude, Okay, all right. I'm going to use this microphone. Oh, oh, just kidding. I think, sorry. Okay, a little bit of a problem with the mic, but it looks like we're back. So so I'm going to back up just a second um, and, and repeat what I was saying. Thank you all for letting me know that the audio went out. Um, so let's, let's think about sort of this positive attitude idea from kind of like a, um, a pop culture lens a pop culture framework so you will listen to motivational speakers or self-help gurus who will say well you know you should just have a positive attitude and that that will fix all your problems um and you know if you're even a little bit of a critical thinker then you're going to listen to that and you're going to say hey wait a second here like it, i mean it really can't be that simple right like if you have cancer and your spouse leaves you and your children get in a car wreck and the economy crashes and aliens start destroying the earth like are you really telling me that Okay. All right. My word. I apologize for that. This Let me Sorry about that. Joys of live streaming. I'm going to try to set that mic up again. And thank you all in the chat for letting me know. Okay. All right. Well, my... My good mic is not... Oh. 
Okay, I'm going to give my good mic just one more chance, and if it doesn't work, then I'll use my backup mic. So here we go. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think that, you know, if, you, if you're going to just say, okay, well, a positive attitude is a comprehensive solution to life's suffering, then, then it's like, I, I don't even know what to tell you, man. Like, I, 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 you're clearly operating from such a different base of premises from the majority of humanity that, that I don't even know how to begin to persuade you. Um, however, I don't think that that's what Piercing is saying here. I think, let's think about attitude in a slightly different way, right? Um, you know, we tend to think of attitude as this sort of primarily mental phenomenon, right? Like it's it's just sort of your subjective opinion about the world, right? So if you have a positive attitude about something, it, it it's it's limited. It, there's nothing sort of in the real objective world that is your attitude. Instead, your attitude is something that just you know it's it's a it's a purely psychological phenomenon. It's purely something that exists inside your head. But um, what I think Piercing means here, and the way that I want to invite you all to think about the about an attitude. Um, is that an attitude is more like a stance. It's more like an approach, right? When you think of stance, you know, you think of the way you stand, you think of the way you sit. Um, you know, it's not just a psychological or mental phenomenon. Um, it's something that manifests itself throughout your whole body. And maybe it doesn't just manifest itself throughout your whole body, but sort of throughout your whole way of being, right? Throughout your whole approach to life, right? So when you see attitude, I, I and I think this is the way that piercing means it, I think, uh, I, you, you shouldn't think that this is sort of just like a, a mental attitude. Instead, it's an attitude of, of being. It's a stance. It's an approach to life. Right. So what are we going to have to say about that? Um, sorry, it actually turns out my notes from a couple months ago aren't, aren't, aren't the easiest to interpret always. Um... So if you think about attitude in that kind of way, as, as an approach, as a stance, rather than just as this sort of purely mental phenomenon, then I think you can say that it really probably does make a difference, right? Um, so, f for example, um, well, let's use Piercing's example. I think let's go to that. So one of the things that he mentions is that um, for, for Chris and Piercing and John, if they're driving across the country, if they're driving across Montana on these motorcycles, and they arrive in Billings, Montana, then they're going to see it as a destination. They're going to see this as a pilgrimage. They're going to see Billings, Montana um, as, as kind of a promised land. And that's probably the only time that anyone has ever said that about Billings, Montana, um, which I think is, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful, I think, to see it as a promised land. Um, let me find the specific quote. Yeah, okay, so um, he says, also to arrive in the Rocky Mountains by plane would be to see them in one kind of context as pretty scenery. So he says, you know, if, if Sylvia arrives on an airplane, she just looks around. She's like, oh, this is nice. You know, like what pretty mountains. And he says, but to arrive after days of hard travel across the prairies would be to see them in another way as a goal, a promised land. If John and I and Chris arrived with this feeling, this, you know, sense of, you know, you could almost say a sense of purpose, a sense of mission, a sense of, uh, you know, goal driven behavior. Right. You see Billings, Montana as a as a as a as a destination, as a promised land. Um. If John and I and Chris arrived with this feeling, and Sylvia arrived seeing them as nice and pretty, there would be more disharmony among us than we would get from the heat and monotony of the Dakotas. Right, so notice the idea here is that if, if you have a different approach or attitude, right, if Sylvia comes to Montana with this attitude of, Oh, you know, look at the scenery, and you know, isn't that nice and pretty? Then that will actually uh, that that'll actually manifest itself in more than mental ways, right? It's, it won't just be a sort of a subjective mental attitude. Instead, it will actually cause disharmony between between herself and the and the other members of the group, right? And and you know, conversely, uh, Piercing and Chris and John are going to have all sorts of associations um, and feelings and realizations and and experiences. Right, including empirical experiences that come with them as they travel across the Dakotas, and so when they when they come to Montana, and this is kind of a weird thing to think about, but Montana is not going to be the same place to them as it would be to Sylvia if Sylvia had gotten on the airplane, right? Um, and 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 this is sort of the idea that that Piercing is talking about. So Piercing is going to kind of propose that something like attitude would actually solve the problem of the technological death force, and and there's going to be lots of elaboration over the coming chapters. So if that idea still sounds kooky to you. Um, you know that's okay. Hang on, we're gonna we're gonna get there. We're gonna get to all the explanations. We'll we'll, uh, we'll get to everything and cover everything. I hope. Um, but but at very least, I think you should look at it and say, hey, look, 
if an attitude means more than just a mental phenomenon, if it means more of a stance and approach to life, then you can definitely see how that actually will change things in your life, right? Um, it, it will change, you know, quote unquote, the objective reality around you. Right, so, um, and, and here's another example that I can't help but think of, right? Because if you, if you listen to sort of the, the positive thinking self-help gurus, then the, the counter example that you always want to come up with, right, is uh, things like the Holocaust and concentration camps, right? You're like, okay, that is like the absolute bottom point of human experience, right? Uh, sort of the absolute pit, right? Like things cannot get worse than that, um, than, than being in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II, hypothetically, right? Okay, well, uh, you know, some of you may be familiar with Viktor Frankl, or you may not be. If you, if you uh, aren't, I definitely recommend you pick up his book, Man's Search for Meaning. It's a really interesting book. Um, but so Viktor Frankl is this Austrian, uh, I think Viennese actually, psychologist, um, Jewish, who in World War II actually ended up in a concentration camp. Um, and it was, so, so he's one of these people who has actually lived one of these absolute nadirs of, of human experience, right? Um, he's he's seen the bottom. He hit rock bottom of of what humans can experience, pretty much, right? Uh, you know, starvation, punishment, torture, um, psychological and emotional uh, and social deprivation, everything, right? And and his opinion, this is actually something he's famous for, is he calls it the last of the human freedoms, which is uh, humans' ability to choose their response to any given situation, right? So I hope in that statement, and 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 he said. When you choose your response to these given situations, it actually does change the quality of the experience. Ooh, quality, that's an interesting word, right, that we should talk about with Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It actually changes the quality of the experience. So if you do approach things with a certain attitude, and again, that would be a full stance, that'd be a full approach to life, right? It's not just an, a, a sort of a subjective opinion, right? But if you approached even a concentration camp with the right attitude, then you can make it better than it otherwise would have been at very least. Um, and this is something that, that Viktor Frankl describes. And this is uh, his last of the human freedoms, the, the human ability to, cho to choose your response to any given set of circumstances, no matter how terrible those circumstances are, right? And I, and I hope that in Viktor Frankl's, in his idea of this last of the human freedoms, the, the freedom to choose your response, um, I hope you're seeing Piercing's idea of an attitude or a stance, right? And, and an approach to life. Right, and I hope then you're seeing. Okay, well, I mean, here's here's one way of. Uh, I mean, I mean, here's a here's a very easy. I mean, here here's a very easy, you know, almost trivial example of this. Right, is if I is, is if I go into a store and I and I have the approach. Okay, so primarily what this store is is it's a place for me to pillage, and primarily what all the people in there are is they're victims. Right, they're, either they're victims or obstacles to me. Right, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run in there with a gun and I'm going to rob the the cash register. Right now, notice that I mean I mean I recognize that there are physical actions here, right, and that you know getting shot is not just an opinion; it is actually something physical that happens to you that you probably cannot talk your way out of, at least not once you're shot. Um, but at the same time, notice that if you have that sort of approach, that's actually going to play out in the way that you act in the world, and it's also going to affect the way that everyone else acts around you. Um, whereas conversely, if you see a store primarily as a resource full of, you know, uh, helpful things and also full of, you know, relatively nice, friendly and helpful people who do not, who are not trying to hurt you and do not have it in for you and would actually like to help you, uh, you know, within some reasonable bounds, then what you'll do is you'll go into the store and you'll buy what you need and you'll leave the store and everyone will be happy. Uh, and, and, and so that attitude also is going to reflect itself in the way that you act in the world in, in terms of the physical, you know, quote unquote, objective actions you take and also in terms of the subjective actions that other people take around you. And um, I, I recognize that, uh, you know, you could say, well, OK, but yes, but this is a social phenomenon. So what about, you know, rocks? You know, if a rock falls on me and my attitude about that doesn't doesn't change. Right. Um, okay, well, the the rock example is going to be a little tricky to describe, but let me take kind of a different example, right? Um, it, it is true that if you approach physical, you know, quote-unquote objective phenomena in various ways, you actually elicit various properties from them, right? So, um, for example, here's a good question, right? Is, is fire dangerous um, or is it a useful tool? And the answer is, well, it depends to a very large degree on how you approach it. It depends a lot on your attitude and your stance towards it, right? If you have this attitude and stance of, hey, this thing could get out of control, and so I need to, I, I need to, uh, you know, have water or sand or whatever nearby, but, um, but it's also incredibly useful, 
right? And so I can use it to cook my food and make macaroni and cheese or sear a steak or whatever, right? Then, then actually fire ends up being pretty useful. And that fire, that specific physical phenomenon in front of you um, will, you know, let's say respond to you um, in sort of a, a beneficent, helpful way, right? Uh, you know, conversely, if your attitude about fire is, um, you know, okay, this thing isn't, you know, potentially dangerous at all, right? I don't care. I don't need to prepare sand. I don't need to prepare water. I don't need to watch the fire. Then what happens is, you know, you could light a giant wildfire, uh, burn down uh, hundreds of thousands of acres. You could burn down a city entirely, like for instance, the, the you know, the Great Chicago Fire. And, and now notice the Great Chicago Fire is a very different physical phenomena than delicious mac and cheese with hot dogs, right? Okay, so... Those are very different physical phenomena, even though, you know, they're both manifestations of, you know, a, a similar underlying source, which is, you know, rapid oxidation that we call fire, right? Uh, and so your approach to even physical phenomena does to a very large degree, and, you know, maybe to a very, very large degree, um, influence what kind of, uh, what kind of experience gets elicited from that. Right, and that's kind of a strange thing to think about, and we're going to talk about that quite a bit more because Piercing is going to be very interested in science and about what the relationship between, uh, you know, the mental world and the physical world is. He's going to be very, very interested in that in coming chapters. So we're going to cover that in more detail. But I hope at least uh, up until now I've convinced you that your stance and your attitude towards the world, as Piercing says here, actually is going to influence the kind of experience you have, even if that experience is, you know, quote unquote, you know, perfectly physical and objective. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Do you think attitude is separate from emotional content? I find that if I'm anxious, the root of the problem comes from uncontrollable emotions rather than my attitude towards them. Yeah, so this is a very good question. I'm glad you brought it up because, um, you know, uh, Piercing, you might think that Piercing is saying, well, well, and this is also one of the things that, you know, could very well annoy you about sort of pop psychologists and uh, self-help gurus who say, you know, well, just think positively, right? Just have a better attitude. And you're like, okay, man, but like I'm suffering from chemical depression and, and like you, you just don't seem to understand my problem at all. I can't just be happy, right? Um, and and I mean, that's, that's a perfectly fair objection, right? And I think it's exactly right. Um, let's just say for now, let's just say for now, that uh, your approach changes the nature of the world. And again, we're taking approach in sort of this broad sense, right? Let's, let's just agree for now that your approach um, plays a very large role in terms of what, what phenomena get elicited from the world around you. And let's also say, right, so is attitude separate? Uh, I'll, I'll actually address the question itself now, um, right? Do you think attitude is separate from emotional content? Um, I think I, I certainly understand the separation that you're drawing there, right? Um, you know that in some sense your physiological emotional responses don't seem to be exactly controllable by you, right? Um, and so you know if you're if you're in a horror movie, if you're particularly susceptible to horror movies, um, you know it doesn't necessarily help you to say, oh, you know this is just a movie, it's fake, right? Your your body's still you know, if you're, if you're that kind of person who's more susceptible to horror movies, it's still going to respond as if it's real, right? You, you'll, your heart will beat faster, um, and so on and so forth, right? You'll experience a, a physiological response. And so this is a fair point. However, it's also true that, uh, you know, repeated exposure and, uh, and, you know, psychological training can dampen or change that response to, to at least some degree, right? Um, so, so it certainly seems as though there is a quote-unquote subjective component to that too, even when there's a quote-unquote objective psychological phenomena, physiological, excuse me, phenomena going on. And there's also the fact that, you know, you chose to go into the movie theater, right? Um, you know, and we might assign that to be a subjective choice, right? It certainly looks like you could have done something else, right? You could have, uh, you know, talked to your friends perhaps into doing something else because you know you don't like horror movies. Um that's a possibility, right? So I guess I guess what I would say is I understand the separation that you're drawing, Struggler, between um, attitude and emotional content. I think that in practice, or, well, let, let me just say I don't think it's always easy to draw that distinction. It's not always easy to separate the two out. Um, although I think sometimes sometimes you can. I hope I hope that's a helpful answer. I'm trying to think of a of a better way to answer it. Um, Uh, 
one thing that you could say, and maybe this is what Viktor Frankl will say, and remember, Viktor Frankl is a, is a psychologist, and actually he's quite a famous psychologist, so it's not like, you know, he's just any old person, right? Like he's, and I mean, he's a psychologist from 50 years ago, 60, 70, 80 years ago, so I mean, maybe he's not totally up to date on everything, obviously. Um, but, you know, he might say, well, you know, perhaps you have uh, sort of uncontrollable emotional physiological responses, right? But, you know, I mean, maybe you can change your, uh, you know, he would say it's your last of the human freedoms to change your response to that, right? So, for instance, in the horror movie example, you know, you walk out of the movie theater if you don't like that. Um, or you say, as terrible as this is, um, you know, as terrible as my experience watching this horror movie is, I'm going to I'm gonna grip the arms of my chair and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick through it, right? And, I mean, those are potential responses, right? So, again, I think the key is to see attitude as sort of like this broad, approach and response and stance towards life uh, rather than sort of a, a narrow psychological phenomenon. So there we go. Um, we see this idea playing out a couple of other ways um, in this chapter, right? So um, he tells this story, right, about a motorcycle with an empty gas tank, right? He and Chris are out uh, riding a motorcycle and the motorcycle eventually puts to a stop. And um, and Pierce can't figure out what's wrong with the motorcycle. He can't figure out why the motorcycle won't restart. And he rocks the cycle from side to side, and he hears gas swishing in the tank. And so he thinks, well, it can't be the gas, right? Like, I've got gas. That's not the problem. I don't know what's going on. Um, and he can't fix the problem. And um, this actually ends up cutting their vacation short, and that's pretty uh, unfortunate, right? Um, and what he actually finds out later, what he actually finds out later um, as he's trying to figure out what's wrong with the motorcycle and he, he actually has to have it towed all the way back to his house, you know, total disaster, total vacation disaster, right? When he tows it back to his house and examines it, what he actually finds out is that there's gas in the tank, right? Um, it, the problem is that the, the main tank is empty and there's a secondary fuel tank, a reserve tank that still had gas in it, uh, but you have to flip this little switch to uh, get the engine to access the reserve fuel tank. And so all that time, the motorcycle was fine, right? The motorcycle was fine. You just had to flip a switch and the motorcycle would have kept running because it still had gas in the reserve tank. Um, and so the, the point of this story, right, the point of the story is that um, Piercing's going to talk a lot about the interactions and the relationship between sort of the physical objective world of phenomena, right, and sort of the subjective internal world of thoughts, attitudes, emotions, and experiences, right? So here's the thing you could think about that motorcycle, and this is kind of what Piercing is going to say, is if you look at that motorcycle, the motorcycle is fine. There's nothing about that motorcycle that's dysfunctional. There's nothing about that motorcycle that's broken right? There's, there's nothing about it. It's, it's, it's absolutely 100% fine. In some sense, all the atoms are fine. All the molecules are fine. All this are fine. All the systems in that motorcycle are working exactly as intended, right? And yet the motorcycle still won't run. It still won't uh, sort of serve its purpose. And the reason for that is because there's this sort of slippage or disjunct between, let's say, the, the subjective world of internal uh, experience that Piercing has and the objective world of atoms outside him, right? So the, the motorcycle is fine, right? But the problem is he doesn't know that he needs to flip the switch to access the reserve tank. In fact, he doesn't know that it's the reserve tank that's full. Um, he thinks that there's still gas in the main tank, right? So what's the problem there? The problem is not strictly speaking objective or physical. Um, instead, the problem is you could say it's um, subjective or, or, or mental or emotional, but I think Piercing is going to say ultimately it's it's the relationship between those two, right? It's It's the fact that you have the wrong attitudes belonging to the wrong phenomena uh, and that if you match those two up then you know then the motorcycle would work again right so again this is all going back to Piercing's thesis right where you remember the trilemma right the trilemma of responses to the system and Piercing is trying to propose an alternate solution right Piercing is trying to propose an alternate solution that alternate solution is somehow tied to attitude broadly construed right so another example of this is he talks about another bad experience he had with motorcycle maintenance where uh, he had a motorcycle, the engine kept seizing up, and he took it to a shop. And in these the, the shop, the mechanics in that shop, he kind of um, describes them as monkeys with wrenches, right? Uh, the way he describes it is that they're, they're not... Um, even though they're technologists, even though their job is all about technology, it's all about motorcycles, they're still achieving the same kind of sort of distance from the technology that John and Sylvia Sutherland are, you know, by getting on their motorcycle and riding away from their normal lives, right? So these these mechanics in the shop are achieving that distance from technology um, by playing music, they're telling jokes, they're distracted from their work, they're not really focusing on it. And the way that Piercy describes that is, um, he says they they don't 
They don't care about the job. They don't identify with the job. He says, you know, actually, I'll, I'll pull out the specific quote and read it, I think. Um... Yeah, so he says the question, and so they butcher the maintenance shop on his motorcycle, these, these mechanics that he describes as monkeys with wrenches. And he says, the question why comes back again and again, and has become a major reason for wanting to deliver this Chautauqua. Why did they butcher it so? These were not people running away from technology like John and Sylvia, these were the technologists themselves. They sat down to, a, to do a job, and they performed it like chimpanzees, nothing personal in it. There was no obvious reason for it. And I tried to think back to that shop, that nightmare place, to try to remember anything that could have been a cause. And he says, you know, they uh, what he assigns a few possible causes, like the fact that they're distracted by music, um, and they just seem distracted in general. But he says the biggest clues seem to be their expressions. They were hard to explain. Good-natured, friendly, easygoing, and uninvolved. They were like spectators. You had the feeling they just wandered in there themselves and somebody had handed them a wrench. There was no identification with the job. No saying, I am a mechanic. At 5 p.m., or whenever their eight hours were in, you knew they would cut it off and not have another thought about their work. They were already trying not to have any thoughts about their work on the job. In their own way, they were achieving the same thing John and Sylvia were, living with technology without really having anything to do with it. Or rather, they had something to do with it, but their own selves were outside of it, detached, removed. They were involved in it, but not in such a way as to care. So he's going to say the problem with these, these mechanics is that they don't identify with their work. They don't care about their work. They don't have any sense of sort of personal investment in their work. They're still, um, you know, even though they're performing the physical movements associated with their job as mechanics, um, they're psychologically, you know, and perhaps you could even say sort of emotionally or spiritually distant from that work, right? Um, you know, as he says, there's no identification with their job. There's no saying, I am a mechanic. It's just sort of, uh, you know, I'm not part of this. I'm not part of this. Um, and he's going to say that, that that lack of identification, right? So notice that lack of identification, that's what Piercing would call an, an, an attitude, right? It's an approach. It's a stance. It's a way that you approach your work as a mechanic. And what Piercing is going to say is that the, uh, to identify with your work, to care about it deeply and, and intensely, that sort of attitude, that sort of approach, that sort of stance um, is going to and there will be a lot of uh, expounding on this later, right? But that sort of approach is actually going to heal the system. That's actually going to fix the death force that's, that seems to reside in technology. And presumably by extension, um, it will fix the problem of the death force that resides in corporations or uh, the economy or government or schools or, or your job or whatever else it is. Um, okay, so I hope, I hope we're all stitching this together fairly adequately. Let me take just one second to look at chat. Okay, yes. Yeah, so this is a. I'm 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 glad that we've brought this up, right? So, um, Piercing's problem. Chat says Piercing's problem sounds like it was a problem with knowledge rather than attitude. When you say that all problems that have to do with the physical world are actually problems with knowledge rather than with the physical world itself, the answer will always be available in the physical world. In the physical world, if it wasn't, then it wouldn't be a problem. Knowledge is what stops you from finding solutions. So yes, but what Piercing's going to come back and say is, well, hang on, wait a second. Uh, it's actually your attitude that's going to reveal the right kind of knowledge to you right it's a, it's a and thank you for these questions by the way right because it's great to you know have that tension and push back uh and and you know figure out exactly what it is that piercing is saying so that we can figure out exactly you know whether or not it's any good and if it's any good uh how, how much good it is right so thank you very much chat um yeah so what he's going to say is well yes right so the problem is knowledge right even if the atoms of the motorcycle are right the problem is knowledge but, and this is going to de get developed a little more in later chapters, he's going to say, the reason why you don't have the right knowledge is because you have the wrong attitude. And this is actually exactly what he's talking about in this story with the, the, the mechanics uh, bungling the maintenance job on his motorcycle, is, is they just do a terrible job, right? And in fact, they totally misdiagnose the problem uh, with the motorcycle. And I think they actually do it a couple of times. And Piercig's uh, response that is going to be say the reason why they misdiagnosed the problem the reason why they had the wrong information and the wrong knowledge is actually because they had the wrong attitude and and if that's true then it's so smart it's so smart because because what it means is that if you fix your attitude again and i'm not saying this in sort of like the pop psychologist way i'm saying it's sort of the broader deeper more nuanced sort of approach or stance way but if you fix your attitude in that sense 
then you will actually begin to elicit the right information and data and uh, experiences from the world, and that will actually fix your problems. And if that's true, then that's a really interesting idea, and that's a really powerful idea. You know, and we'll have plenty more chances to uh, examine what he means and understand that and evaluate it. Um, but I, but I do think that uh, you know, it certainly seems to me that he makes an excellent point here that it's it's the attitude, uh, or at least that the attitude plays a pretty significant role in revealing the right information, right? Because the, these mechanics who are misdiagnosing the cycle, they do have information about the cycle. The problem is that their information is poorly informed, or else it's correct, but it's not useful information. It's the wrong information. Um, all right, let's see. Um, so it's 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 this it's the separation. Yeah, actually, let me pull out one more quote where he describes um, the way that he eventually he eventually diagnosed the problem correctly on his motorcycle and fixed it. Let me actually pull out the exact quote um, so that I can get that right. Sorry, that's chapter one. He says, I found the cause of the seizures a few weeks later, waiting to happen again. It was a little 25 cent pin in the internal oil delivery system that had been sheared and was preventing oil from reaching the head at high speeds, the engine head, right? So it so he diagnoses the problem correctly, and here's how he describes that experience, right? And so this is this is sort of his phenomenological description of, of how it was to find that pin. Well, well, actually, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll read this whole last last three paragraphs, and I think that'll wrap up, um, wrap it up for today. Um, so he talks about how the same sort of problem of separation, right? The mechanic is separated from the machine, separated from his work, right? John and Sylvia are trying to separate themselves from technology. Um, Piercing notices the same problem. Piercing at this time was actually writing technical manuals for a living, and so he says that the same problem exists there. He calls them spectator manuals, the sense of separation between the text and the self. Um, yeah, so he says these technical manuals were full of errors, ambiguity, ambiguities, omissions, and information so completely screwed up, you had to read them six times to make any sense out of them. But what struck me for the first time was the agreement of these manuals with the spectator attitude I had seen in the shop. These were spectator manuals. It was built into the format of them. Implicit in every line is the idea that here is the machine, isolated in time and in space from everything else in the universe. It has no relationship to you. You have no relationship to it other than to turn certain switches, maintain voltage levels, check for air conditions, and so on. That's it. The mechanics in their attitude toward the machine were really no different we're really taking no different attitude from the manuals toward the machine or from the attitude I had when I brought it in there. We were all spectators, right? And the opposite of a spectator would be somebody who's involved in the process, presumably. Right, and it occurred to me that there is no manual that deals with the real business of motorcycle maintenance, the most important aspect of all. Caring about what you are doing is considered either unimportant or taken for granted. On this trip, I think we should notice it, explore it a little, to see if in that strange separation of what man is from what man does, we may have some clues as to what has gone wrong in this 20th century. I don't want to hurry it. That itself is a poisonous 20th century attitude. When you want to hurry something, that means you no longer care about it and you want to get on to other things. I just want to get at it slowly, but carefully and thoroughly, with the same attitude I remember was present just before I found that sheared pin. It was the attitude that found it, nothing else. So he's going to say what, what Piercing's opinion is, and this is, again, his own phenomenological experiential report of what it was like to find that sheared pin and, you know, finally correctly diagnose the problem and be able to fix it, is it, he says it was it was a sort of, um, it was an attitude, right? An attitude, and the way he describes that is carefully, thoroughly, and slowly. Um, this, this certain attitude, and that's how he found the sheared pin, and that's how he fixed his motorcycle. So Piercing's position is definitely going to be, if we fixed our attitude, again, broadly, broadly construed right we actually would be able to find the right information and also have you know take the right actions in the world so that we could fix our problems and that that would actually you know his ultimate thesis is going to be that would actually fix the problem of the technological death force in technology and you know i'm extending that and saying that would also fix the problem of the, de the death force in 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 politics in economics in education, in the economy, in corporations, in your daily job, right? Like whatever job it is that you're working and, you know, perhaps how 
uh, however, you know, uh, sort of alienating that job may or may not be, you know, you know, it may be, right? Um, Piercing is trying to propose a solution to this, and it relates to attitude, and he's, he's, it's not going to be in sort of the shallow pop culture way, but instead he's going to say, no, like, it, it's, it's something about that attitude that will actually enable us to elicit the right information and bring about the correct, let's call them real, you know, quote-unquote objective changes in the world. Um, and, I, yeah, I'm going to reread a portion of that just because I think it's so important, right? And it occurred to me that there is no manual that deals with the real business of motorcycle maintenance, the most important aspect of all. Caring about what you're doing is considered either unimportant or taken for granted. Okay, well, we've gone to about an hour and 10 minutes, so I think that's enough for today. Um, if I'm feeling up to it, I think I'm going to try to stream tomorrow because I've, I've recognized that I have, you know, there's going to be like 30 to 50 of these. And if I don't get going on them, then I'm never going to get them all done. So, once again, thank you all to uh, all of you who showed up live for this um, and for your comments in the chat. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure for me to do this. Um, to all of you who are listening to this in the future, you know, I can't wait to hear your comments below, and I hope to see you in the next video. So, um, with that, thank you very much, and I will see you all in the next one.